and welcome to Book Dreams, the podcast for everyone who loves books and has ever wondered about them. I'm Julie Sternberg, author of a number of children's books, including Like Pickle Juice on a Cookie and its sequels, and the Top Secret Diary of Celie Valentine series. And I'm Eve Yohalem, also a children's book author. My books include The Truth According to Blue and Cast Off, The Strange Adventures of Petra de Winter and Brom Broen. In each episode of this podcast, we explore a book-related musing, something we've wondered about for a long time, or maybe it's just very recently struck us. In this episode, we tackle book design, because we realized we know almost, or we knew almost nothing about book design, either as readers or as writers. As readers, we often experience book design unconsciously, or at least I do, and people are often surprised to learn how little writers actually have to do with the design of their own books. With very few exceptions, publishers control the covers, the design, even the titles of most books. Even for picture book authors where the text is not very extensive, publishers choose the illustrators and they communicate suggestions to the illustrators. So the authors have very little say, although they're the ones who've come up with the story. Right. And I just want to interrupt for a second to just make it crystal clear that when a writer writes a picture book, the writer doesn't even get to help choose the illustrator. I mean, usually publishers will ask your opinion, but the publisher gets to make the choice of the illustrators. And often writers never even speak directly to the illustrators. It's very strange. So we wondered, why do books end up looking the way they do? Why are the decisions made the way they're made? Um, Who has control within the publishing industry over the aesthetics and formatting of books? And is that power ever subverted? I'm so excited about this particular episode, because we asked two people who know a lot about this, people with extensive experience in book design, Rafe Larson and Ellen Lupton. And we've admired both of them from afar. And when we asked them if they would talk to us on this episode, they both said yes. Yay. Yay. And also, this is our first episode where we interview two people. So let me tell you a little bit about Rafe Larson. His first novel, The Selected Works of T.S. Spivett, was a New York Times bestseller and is currently translated into 27 languages. The novel was shortlisted for the Guardian First Book Award and the James Tate Black Memorial Prize and was adapted into a movie by Jean-Paul Genet. His second novel, I Am Radar, was published in 2015. And Ellen Lupton is a writer, curator, educator, and designer. She's founding director of the Graphic Design MFA program, at the Maryland Institute College of Art, where she's authored numerous books on design processes. She also serves as senior curator of contemporary design at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in New York City. She received the AIGA Gold Medal for Lifetime Achievement in 2007, and she was named a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2019. We started by talking with Ellen about the usual fundamental conventions of the book, conventions that are so viscerally ingrained, we don't really stop to think about them, even though there's not really a logic to them. Books have certain parts that are established over centuries of practice. So we talk about front matter and back matter, which are kind of the front door and the back door of a book. And then we have chapter divisions, which are literary ideas, but they are signaled through graphic design, through often a chapter has to begin on the right-hand page. Mm -hmm. Why? It's a convention. Every book begins on a right-hand page. Those are parts of the architecture of a book that are recognizable to people and help you know Are you in the beginning, the middle, or the end? So all those signals help us to perceive the arc of a book. You're yet again reminding me of that moment when you open a card that opens up to a spread, and I always start writing on the right-hand side. The beginning (laughs) will feel like it's on the right, even though actually that blank left-hand side is there. Why wouldn't you begin there? It's part of the rhythm of book design. I totally know what you meant with the card thing. (laughs) Every time I open a card, it just feels weird to be writing on the right-hand side, and yet that's what we do. And then you have to write along the margin and and then put in arrows because there's no etiquette around, well, once you've filled that up, do you go to the back? Do you go to the left? It's so strange. And as a result, I tend to try to look for just the flat card where you write on the front (laughs) and then you have to flip it over and write on the back. But those are so boring. 
Anyway, enough of that tangent. It is, I think, an interesting way that this sort of innate understanding of books has seeped into our everyday lives. And I think both Rafe and Ellen make really interesting use of that innate understanding. Here is Ellen on the kinds of signals that she gives us when we're reading informational nonfiction. When I'm creating a book, I'm really thinking about the reader. How will people find this information on the page? How will they know what's important? How will they know what they can skip? I think there's a big myth about typography, that it's about helping people to read more. And actually, I think most people are trying to read less. Uh (laughs) It's different with fiction, where you really want somebody to read a book from start to finish. But most books are not ever read that way. So a designer and the author, and I really believe they're intertwined, is creating entry and exit points. When can someone feel like it's okay to stop? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I write books often with layers, like a cake. And someone might want to just read the top layer of this chapter, but go in deep on another, depending on their interest. If I have a section of a book that has six spreads, I want to make sure that if someone reads just the first spread, they've gotten the main idea. And that where that information ends is like on a clean note. Ellen is really good at using those innate understandings to help you decide basically what you can skip if you're not interested in going further. But Rafe figured out a way to manipulate those conventions about where readers can stop in a way that really enhances his story. He made the less important spaces, the overlookable spaces, unmissable. This happens in his first book, The Selected Works of T.S. Spivet. It's really quite extraordinary and something you should see for yourself. For anyone who hasn't read T.S. Spivet, it's about a 12-year-old genius cartographer and son of a Montana rancher who goes on both a literal and figurative quest to process his grief over a terrible loss. I just want to give a sense of what's actually on the page when you look at this book. There are photographs. There are drawings. There is doodling. You have commentary, multiple typefaces and type sizes. I can't actually think of another book like this book. And the crazy thing is that Rafe had no real visual art training. His parents are artists, his dad's a printmaker and a painter, his mom's a painter and a photographer, and he's always loved illustrating, he said. But that was the extent of it. He had no formal training. I'm so, so jealous. I would love to be able to use my own illustrations in my books. But my brain does not work that way. I cannot even do bubble letters. Me neither. I never made it past stick figures. And I also do this kind of weird globular rabbit. I want to see that. (laughs) I will draw you my weird globular (laughs) rabbit one day. (laughs) Anyway, here's Rafe describing how T.S. Spivet evolved from a traditional text-based story into the unconventional novel he ultimately wrote. T.S. Spivet was my master's thesis and my first novel that I'd ever written. So I kind of didn't know what I was doing which can be both a blessing and a curse. You know, you're blessed with this kind of naivete that you can do anything. So it gave me a sort of freedom in the process that I didn't have to be kind of burdened by, oh, this is the way it's done. So initially, I wrote the book almost all the way through without any illustrations at all and got to the end and felt like something really key was missing. Mm -hmm. I had sort of established his digressive voice and that he'll like launch into something, you know, some kind of sidebar. But I wrote the book in Microsoft Word. So all those digressions were passed to footnotes. And I really, I struggle with footnotes. I I don't find them like visually or sort of spatially or narratively intuitive. So it was at that point that I started experimenting with the page and actually kind of stumbled across the idea that each page could kind of be a map. So, you know, here's this map maker who's kind of testing the the limits of cartography and mapping, and suddenly the book began to reflect what one can and can't do with maps. That was like a breakthrough, I think. And kind of alongside that, I started filling in these illustrations. I migrated the footnotes to the side and had these little arrows that directed the reader. And then I started illustrating the narrator's illustrations myself. And I really wanted every page and the form of the book to be an expression of the character's own kind of psychology in that he's looking for a language to process his grief and to process 
his understanding of the world. So in the beginning, in particular, he only makes sort of revelations or connections in the safety of the sidebars. And gradually, the relationship between the main text and the sidebars, I think, changes as he develops as a character. But that was like really critical for me as a storyteller, because I, I kind of wanted to turn the whole idea of you know, you can skip over footnotes. And I was like, what if what's in the footnotes is actually the most crucial thing? I was often thinking just even about that arrow that takes you from the main text to the sidebar. As a reader journeys on that arrow, their mindset changes and develops, you know? So you have to take that into account as part of their journey. And I thought a lot about the white space around the sidebars as well. Like my father, when he first read the book, he was kind of quiet about it. And then at the end, he just said, I like the white space. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> Such an artist thing to say. <laughs> what does that even mean? You know? <laughs> but I, I think he was talking that like, the, you know, the danger when you start illustrating anything is that you can illustrate everything, right? So it becomes a real exercise in selection. So he, I think, was saying that he appreciated the pages where there was just room to breathe as much as the pages where there was a lot of commentary. It's very interesting that there's really important character information that comes through in the margins, which is really the area that, as you said, so often readers skip in other books. So can you talk a little bit more about that decision? I think this character is almost a little shy about his forays. You know, he hides things. So to me, it became a sort of exercise in vulnerability, I guess. I like narratives that you feel like you're discovering alongside the character. And so I wanted to visualize that, where occasionally you'll have like a point made, and then you'll have an arrow, and a second point will be made. And there's that critical distance between those two points. So you almost felt the character going a little bit further out mm -hmm. on the limb yeah. um, and a little bit further out. And sometimes the further out on the limb would be in his illustration, where words fail. I really like this reminder that what can seem like lightning bolts stroke of innovation or genius, that often those moments are actually evolutions of thought, the result of really hard work. Absolutely. I wonder... Are there ever lightning bolt strokes of genius? I think most discoveries are iterative that way, and it's always interesting to hear people describe what their process was. Rafe told us that people warned him not to sketch things out and put things in the margins the way he was. They said, that's not how it's done. You're going to anger the publishers. They're not going to be interested because it's so unusual. But in fact, he got an agent right away who was very enthusiastic, and there was wide interest among publishers. And he says he thinks that there was wide interest because of the newness of it, because it felt fresh, because he challenged those conventions. Yeah, that bold, dangerous decision was the key to the success of the book, which I love. And I also love, you know, he's trusting the reader to follow him into the margins, to follow him off the right. page, and knowing that that might make us uncomfortable, and trusting us to be okay with that discomfort and then trusting the marketplace to be okay. And he was right, because the book was a huge success. Um, it's interesting, too. He said they developed an audiobook of T.S. Spivet. And obviously, an audiobook has no visual component. But it ended up working in its own way, too, which I think is a great example that different formats can have different strengths and weaknesses. So here's Rafe on how the audiobook came to be. For a long time, I held out that there could be no audio version of the book for obvious reasons. Um, and eventually, I think it was a couple of years ago, someone approached me and said, I understand your trepidation, but I think it could really work. And she showed me like a little snippet and convinced me that actually there is a viable version. And basically, it sort of follows the arrows for the most part. And you lose, obviously, the illustrations. But what you gain is that immediacy of voice that mm -hmm, I think is, mm -hmm. propels the novel. Interesting. I've had some people who said that they've listened to it, and they think it's actually like a lot of the humor comes out in it that way. I don't think it's like a replacement experience, but it's another way of experiencing it, and it can certainly work. When you first release a book, you want to protect it. But as time goes by, it's like a trial that you're like, yeah, just don't break your leg. Right. <laughs> yeah. You're on your own. Yeah. I love that comparison. Just don't break your leg. It sort of reminds me when my first child was born, my sister-in-law said to me, now listen, when you hire a babysitter, what you're really going to want to ask her is, would you take a bullet 
for this child. And she said, but you can't actually ask her that because then the babysitter will think you're crazy and not want to work for you. <laughs> um, and then, I don't know, by the time my kids were four or five years old, my, my criteria had changed somewhat. And it was more like, is this person sentient? <laughs> We just have to trust it'll be okay. Let go of our books and our children and trust that our readers will take from it what they want to take from it. And even if that's not what we wanted them to take from it, that's great too. Right. I think I might be better at that with my books than I am with my children. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. <laughs> I need to let go. Yeah. yeah. That's another episode. But we do need to embrace change. Yes. And Ellen likewise says that we should embrace changes in new formats. Just as Rafe was noting that with respect to the audiobooks, we spoke with her about both audiobooks and eBooks, and we kind of assumed that she wouldn't love them because book design doesn't really translate. But she surprised us by focusing on the usefulness of those formats in transferring power and access to the reader, including folks with disabilities. Every time you pick up a physical book, you see the title and the author, but you virtually never see it when you're reading an ebook. So I definitely don't remember the titles and authors, but the story itself isn't as memorable. And the sameness, right, that you're using the same fonts, whether you're reading Ulysses or like pickle juice on a cookie. Not that there's a difference in quality. No, I'm, I'm, I'm comparing <laughs> I'm your work to Joyce, Julie. <laughs> Just take it. <laughs> But but that's I'm more for pickle juice myself. Yeah. Okay, but but it's absurd that every book looks the same and I'm curious about why it hasn't evolved more and where you see ebooks going. Well, with an ebook actually you the reader can change the font. And I think that's a nice thing that readers can make that choice. It's a shift of power of who has the power. Mm-hmm. If a reader has difficulty reading small text, they can make it bigger if they want a heavier weight font or a less delicate font. I think that's really cool. I think we just, as writers, have to embrace all these changes and see what the value is. So tell us about the book that you're working on. And and please read the title and the subtitle so everyone will know. (laughs) I'm in the middle of a book. So this book is called Extra Bold, a feminist, inclusive, subversive, non-binary field guide for graphic designers. And it's a kind of primer of feminist theory and workplace practice for people in the design field, especially people entering the field. The idea of subversive is about challenging power structures and money and who's in control and who's not. And then non-binary refers to to gender identity, but also to binary thinking in general, which is so powerful in graphic design. Um, Roman, italic, where does that come from? Somebody made that up. Mm -hmm. It's like a Renaissance concept that is now ingrained in the way we think about print. Identity of all sorts, racial identity, gender identity, has all been binarized. And that's very mythic and harmful and something that designers can challenge through their work. So we're having great fun and it's illustrated my friend. I cannot wait to read it. I cannot wait to read it. And I've (laughs) decided now to add the word subversive subversive at least, perhaps non binary. To your next picture book. (laughs) Like pickle juice on a cookie, a a subversive middle grade novel. (laughs) The idea of pickle juice and a cookie (laughs) is about challenging what goes together. That's true. Right. And to (laughs) not assume that you can't have both. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So now things start to get really juicy. Here we are talking to Ellen about how publishers use covers to wield power to influence buyers and how they do and don't share that power with authors. There's that cliche, you can't judge a book by its cover, mm-hmm. but actually we do. And that's what you the covers do. are there for. Yeah, that's why <laughs> yeah. they exist. And right. in the beginning of publishing, books didn't have covers you would simply buy the paper part of the book and book collectors would add their own cover. So the idea of the book even having a cover as a marketing tool is a 19th century idea and it's like mass market and you're trying to sell things to people who aren't, you know, book collectors. So the book cover is usually designed by a separate person from 
the person who designs the interior of the book. And that person with the cover is really creating an enticement for you to pick up the book and purchase it. And today, of course, often we're buying books online. So that enticement has to work at the size of a postage stamp, and it becomes a kind of logo for your book. So if you think of the books of Malcolm Gladwell, whose career took off with his book, The Tipping Point, and the rest of his books follow essentially the formula of that design. So mm -hmm. the cover of The Tipping Point became a kind of brand for him. And many other authors have imitated that feeling. Actually, it's their publishers and editors who are doing it, but have created covers that remind us of the tipping point. Like a brand, it's keying into people's memory and their association. It's yeah. a kind of meme. Yeah, it's a, that's interesting. Can I? Yeah, yeah. Along those lines, I noticed, I remember there was a very long time where you wouldn't see any illustrated covers on YA, on young adult books. You would only see photographs of girls or boys sort of often from behind or, you know, and, and they right, were not the showing race. the face because yeah. you don't want to have too, too strong an exactly. association of but a person. Then I have friends who are young adult authors and they could never get the publishers to veer from this notion that they had to have the photograph of yeah. some generic teenager on the cover. Uh -huh, well, and, very interesting. And for the first novel I published was a middle grade novel, and the, the publisher felt that there had to be a photograph on the cover, and they used my editor's daughter as the model who had long blonde hair. And as a result, I had to go back and change the physical description of my main character who didn't have long blonde hair. <laughs> and now she has long blonde hair because it was really important that we have that photograph. And I, I won't ask the specifics of that case because I don't want you to have to answer, but in general, authors don't have a say. So if you have a character who has different characteristics and you don't want that, it, often you nonetheless have to go back and change the text to match the cover, I think. Um, yeah. Authors have very little um, involvement in the designs of their book, whether it's the book design or the book cover design. And we don't have expertise in that most of the time. Some authors do, you do. But given that most authors don't have expertise, and yet given that the author is the author. Do you think that authors should have more involvement in any of the design components? I do, and I think we're very quick to discount our expertise. I mean, who could be more of an expert in your book than you? That doesn't mean that you're going to design the book yourself. Really successful authors will have it in their contract that they have refusal rights on book cover design. And I think often authors have been their worst enemy on this, like saying, oh, my niece is a painter and she's going to yeah. do the book cover and this stuff is horrific. Yeah. So we do want to trust editors and marketing departments. They do have a lot of expertise, but so do authors. And I really think that we're cut out because it costs too much money to involve our meddling eyes in this process. You write books on design and design mm -hmm. the books about design. Do you design your own covers? Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. I, I'm actually really bad at designing covers. It's actually a whole different mindset. It's more like creating a poster. And I'm all about how will people encounter the text on the page. Can you give an example or two of the differences between what you came up with and then what what a jacket designer came up with and why you liked that person's more. I have a book that's coming out in a month or two about design and healthcare. And my friend Jenny Tobias, she did a lot of the illustrations for the book and the cover. And we did many covers. And I did some. And she did some. And I just hated all of mine. But I hated a lot of hers, too. It's like <laughs> it, it, it takes a lot of false starts. But the process is iterative, and you have to see different things. And it's too bad that authors aren't part of it, because it would be so fascinating to see all the rejected covers for your book. OK, listeners, now it's time for what Julie and I have taken to calling our Random Comic Sans Outtake. Yes. So I overheard a young person saying to a friend, Something along the lines of, 
And she used Comic Sans. I mean, can you imagine? Like it was the worst, the most egregious faux pas to have used that font. And I had no idea what she was talking about. So I raised it with Alan. Apparently, people do get really up in arms about fonts. People get very passionate about it. So here's what Ellen has to say on the subject, which may settle the debate once and for all. There are whole subreddits on Comic Sans and Papyrus and the evils of these typefaces. Yes. And, and I if, think graphic designers should get over it right. and get beyond it. If you like it, use it. And now we get back to our discussion of power and how it's shared in the writing and design of books. We continued our conversation about collaboration with Rafe. Here he is talking about how he worked with translators for T.S. Spivet. I was lucky enough that Yes, it was translated into a bunch of languages. So I had a bunch of covers to look at. And that was fascinating to see the kind of visual language of the different cultures. Did you have any favorites or did anything particularly strike you about the cover design from another country that seemed really revealing about some kind of cultural difference? Yeah, I mean, what was nice is that I got to work with the translators quite closely. I was a little nervous at the time, like, I'm not going to like write one word of my book in German. I have to really trust this human to get the essence of my book in German. And you'll never know. If you don't speak German, you will never know how close they got. No. <laughs> yeah. I very early on encountered the strangeness of translation. The Germans wanted to change the, the title of the book. So the German title is Karte meine Trauma, which is a map of my dreams, which to me is a little cheesy, a little bit on the nose. But I had a long conversation with my German publisher, and he said, no, you don't understand. Die Karte has a sort of technical aspect to it, atlas, and Troma in German has a luminous quality. So there's this that frisson between the technical aspect of atlas and dream. He's like, it'll drive Germans quite crazy. They'll love it. Can you believe that the German word for dream is trauma? <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> I'm still stuck on that. I know. I know. Unbelievable. I yeah. <laughs> There's something about that. I haven't quite teased it out. Anyway, it turns out that Rafe is now working on his first children's book. So the children's book that you're writing, um, yes. what genre is it? Is it illustrated? What's the design process like? Yeah. It's this kind of spiritual cousin to Spivet in some ways. It's about a nine-year-old girl named Uma who loves to make charts and her teachers kind of dismiss her chart making as doodles. But one day she gets assigned in one of her classes to make a chart of her house. And the central question is how do you chart not just a house, but a home? It's very interesting. You know, I've never written a children's book before. So my publisher, Ann Schwartz of Schwartz and Wade, her editorial feedback has been great. But she keeps talking about, you know, because as a novelist, I'm obsessed with interiority, characters musing to themselves, heavy dialogue, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, in kids' books, it's all about action. Things have to happen. Forget the interiority. It'll show that in the image, actually, in a weird way. So that's been really, actually, this kind of essentializing of text into action has been a really interesting writing exercise. Is it your experience that the interiority does not go into the illustrations, as I think the editor said to him, that it's usually action, action, action? Am I misunderstanding? Well, I don't know. I mean, as you know, I'm working on my first picture book, so I haven't gotten to that point yet. I know that I'm really struggling with what not to convey in words. That is a real right. challenge for me as someone who has not written anything illustrated before. So I definitely felt like I could relate to what Rafe was saying. Yeah, it's very hard. Anyway, finally, we talked with Rafe about children's book in general and how many of the best ones explore subversions of power. All my favorite books through my uh, childhood and adolescence, I felt like were ones that I didn't actually fully understand. There was like a hint of weirdness or miracle about them or just a lot of Raoul Dahl I didn't fully understand. And then you go back and realize how subversive it really was. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is a perfect, perfect segue to, uh, we have one final question. It has nothing to do with design. Louisa Mayalcott is a minor character in T.S. Pivot and mm -hmm. or rather in T.S.'s mother's story about her ancestors. Mm -hmm. One of the episodes we're doing for Book Dreams is about Louisa May Alcott and Little Women and how the version we all grew up reading is actually not the original version. So this totally caught my eye. And 
why is Louisa May Alcott in the book? What is your own Little Women history? Or did you, how, how did that happen? I thought when I read Little Women that it was pretty subversive. And I really loved the new version that came out, Greta Gerwig's version. I just read an article about the choreography in that movie. There's just constant movement across the, the screen, bodies moving in and out, this kind of almost perpetual engine to it. And I felt that way reading it. And so I guess that was influential for me for this ancestor's character, that she was sort of moving against the grain, up current, and literally across the country. And, you know, starting her own schools. And I've always been interested in the very first women's colleges. What did it take to believe in that institution when all evidence pointed against it? What are the motors behind these kind of forebearers that broke new ground? Where did they find their guidance? That's something I was trying to explore in that backstory. Is that like, and in, in general, it's also how I often feel about just writing. It's like, all evidence points that you should quit and stop at this moment. So right? why like, do you keep going? <laughs> why do you keep doing it? We're crazy in a way, right? We're totally crazy. And I'm sure Louisa May Alcott felt this way. Like, what does a woman do back then? Why would she ever write and take all the abuse of a man's world? And yet she did and Joe did. And um, the people who break ground have an energy that we must always be grateful for. And maybe we can like bottle it and preserve it in our own lives a little bit. I just love that, Julie. The people who break ground have an energy that we must always be grateful for, and maybe we can bottle it and preserve it in our own lives a little bit. I, that's something I have to tape to the computer monitor, you know? <laughs> I agree. I agree. And I think that maybe that's it for this episode of the Book Dreams podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And if you like the podcast and think someone else would too, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player. Be sure to let us know if there's a book-related topic you've wondered about, and we'll try looking into it in a future episode. You can reach us for that reason, or any other reason, at contact at bookdreamspodcast.com. We're also on Twitter at bookdreamspod and on Instagram at bookdreamspodcast. Many thanks to our associate producer, Gianfranco Lentini, and to our theme music composer, Maya Polsky. You can find Eve at eveohallam.com and me at juliesternberg.com. And check out the podcast website, www.bookdreamspodcast.com. Until next time, happy book dreaming. Happy book dreaming. Love, come listen to Book Dreams with Julie and me.